chronic responses to cold exposure. Um, now we're going to describe how we leverage uh, exposure in order to boost heat production, maybe using cold exposure as a therapy, but perhaps more to the point in individuals like this, helping them tolerate these frigid extreme conditions. And so field testing provides a natural experiment where we can observe what happens to an individual in response to chronic, persistent cold exposure. Now, as we acknowledged at the start, it's not only cold exposure. Imagine doing something like this, being pretty strenuous, not getting a lot of sleep, and there's other stresses involved as well, but only over 21, only, over only 21 days of a ski trip in Greenland, which is pretty cold, we observe some characteristic adaptations which you'd expect in response to cold stress. You'd expect an increase in metabolic rate. If you're persistently losing heat, there must be some adaptation where the body generates more. That's the idea we just described. Maybe it's a slight shivering, maybe it's non-shivering thermogenesis, but metabolic rate is 11% higher after only three weeks. We also observe a higher skin temperature. So you can kind of think about this two ways. That's good. It indicates the body's warmer. Uh, and this is in a neutral environment, so maybe this is skewing the results, but it would also present the environment with more hot blood. So to see whether the vasoconstriction um, CIBD response happens, we'd have to test this in a cold environment as well. But there's a higher skin temperature, perhaps owing to the higher metabolic rate. The body is warmer. It generates more heat allowing it to survive perhaps in these more frigid conditions. When we cold stress these individuals, we also observe paradoxically perhaps a reduced shivering threshold. So this is core temp, is it? I actually don't know if that's core or skin temp. We just proposed and presented the idea of skin temp driving um, the shivering threshold, but these are a little high or skin temps. Let's call them skin temps. The difference is really what's important, not the absolute value. There's a reduced shivering threshold after this, uh, this three-week expedition, which you might think is, um, is a bit paradoxical because that allows more body heat to be lost in the face of the cold. Uh, body temperature is allowed to drop lower which might be a greater stress, which might mean more heat is lost, and you're, you're uh, starting from a compromised point in the cold. Your body heat is lower before you begin to shiver. Um, it could be that in these individuals where they're also skiing, towing big heavy bags, maybe this is proactive because that energy needs to go elsewhere. It's possible. Maybe we allow core body temperature to drop more so that we don't use so much of that precious carbohydrate not doing work. It's actually not a bad idea only because we've already exhibited a higher metabolic rate. So we allow core temperature to drop more, but we have a better safety net. We have a higher metabolic rate that can produce more heat and maintain this lower temperature perhaps a bit better and prevent it from slipping lower in the cold. Not exactly sure, but it's, it's a noteworthy adaptation. You, you could argue that you should uh, observe a higher shivering threshold, that you shiver sooner so body heat doesn't drop as far because you're trying to protect against cold exposure. Well, maybe the combined stress of needing energy to do, to do something else resulted in this response. We're not sure. But some typical adaptations here that we would expect, some other interesting stuff that we might not. Overall, this combined response to the cold doesn't give us a whole lot of insight into what cold does to the body. When we look in the lab, we can generally tease out three main responses. And this isn't necessarily a hierarchy. This isn't necessarily a progression of 
first, second, and third adaptation. These are different types of adaptation in response to different severities of exposure. That's how I, I think it's best or it's easiest to grasp these concepts. So one type of exposure can result in habituation or desensitization might be a better word. And we'll talk about each in turn, but briefly, habituation is where we observe shivering responses lower and vasoconstriction doesn't happen as readily. Those are the two things that we talked about acutely that happen to preserve body heat. In this situation, they don't happen as well. That's not good. So desensitization is the first chronic adaptation, the cold stress. Uh, metabolic adaptations can occur. These would support the idea of non-shivering thermogenesis that we just introduced. This allows enhanced shivering. It allows enhanced heat generation through non-shivering means. Overall, metabolism is upregulated to generate more heat. So that's a second set of adaptations to the cold. A third set is what we would have expected in habituation. We'd expect better insulation. These insulative responses are in response to a rather extreme cold exposure where we get enhanced constriction, better peripheral resistance, keeping blood near the core. That, that seems normal to me. You'd expect that to occur in response to repeated cold stress. You don't want to give away that heat for free. So three different types of adaptations. They can occur individually or together, but they depend on the type of stress. It's not one, two, three, unless the type of stress that you incur is one, two, three. And I'll show you what those types of stresses are near the end of the, the section, actually. Well, let's just talk about each of these in turn briefly first. So habituation, there's really nothing else to talk about. The desensitization of shivering and the vasoconstrictor responses. It means in the cold, you produce less heat. Shivering is lower. In the cold, more blood goes to the skin. And maybe there's a temporary benefit of those tissues functioning better because they're warmer. But long term, you end up losing more body heat because hot blood's at the skin where it can lose that heat to the environment. Greater cooling is allowed. We don't know why this happens, and it seems like it's the reverse of what would happen. Our candidates are uh, a decrease in the sympathetic activation. So maybe in acute cold response where the stress is new, you're not used to the cold. There's an emergency signal. The SNS responds in a fight or flight kind of way to say, ooh, I'm not used to this cold. Better vasoconstrict and better shiver. Maybe habituation describes a situation where I've been in the cold repeatedly. It's not as bad as I thought. I don't need to shiver and constrict as much. And that idea holds up if you think about habituation, which is a result of periodic small or low cold stress. It's mild cold stress. We can observe this reflex localized to specific tissue. So in, in fishermen where their hands are exposed a lot of the time, we observe this desensitization in the hands alone, but the rest of the body will maintain that vasoconstrictor response. The rest of the body might shiver. And maybe it makes this a moot point because if the body is hotter, it could send hot blood to the periphery. And we don't need to worry about these responses at the, the individual tissues. But it's still somewhat concerning that the acute responses are lessened. It means the cold exposure has a greater effect. Habituation, typically the result of, like I said, light or mild cold exposure. So if it's not really severe, maybe the body realizes it doesn't have to respond so severely. 
maybe this is the reason why my attempts at doing cold adaptation on my own were unsuccessful. I just wore a light jacket, was cold briefly, and it felt a little uncomfortable. Nothing really happened, and I let myself get colder, and then I didn't like that response. So I said, no, I'm wearing heavy jackets from now on. Maybe that's why. What you'd like to do is experience a cold stress that is, maybe severe is not the right word, but strong enough or potent enough to induce metabolic adaptations. And I say you would like to do as a blanket statement, maybe no one wants to do this, but there might be the, the potential to use this as a therapy where if uh, a stronger cold exposure is experienced regularly, we can bring about some metabolic adaptations. And those metabolic adaptations are an increase in non-shivering thermogenesis. So that uncoupling protein we talked about responds to the cold if the cold is strong enough. There's also a really odd response where the muscle gets more fit. There's a training-like response in the muscle to cold exposure. Metabolic rate goes up, your oxidative capacity goes up, and maybe it's because you're wasting all of this energy and you need to be able to process more energy in metabolism, but some of the same things that are activated by exercise training are activated by cold exposure. There's crossover, which is really odd. But for those individuals that are looking for that extra 1% in their, uh, their personal best performance or trying to uh, enhance their energy expenditure to lose weight, maybe this is a <coughs> not a viable option in and of itself, but maybe it's something that could potentiate the wasting of energy <coughs> in those situations. Um, so the muscle seems to get more trained the mitochondrial volume increases, some other signals are activated as well, and we also can induce more brown adipose tissue. Oddly enough, the signals in muscle that mimic training are also turned on in adipose and make it brown. Any brown tissue that you have becomes more metabolically active, which is another word to say brown adipose tissue also trains. Muscle becomes more oxidative. Adipose becomes more oxidative. And there's also this really interesting phenomenon where white adipose, that is normally not active, starts to brown. White adipose becomes, not, not becomes brown adipose, but starts to transition. Uh, the, the technical term is browning. It ends up being a beige color under a microscope some of the characteristics of a higher mitochondrial content, some of the other proteins are turned up. It's not fully brown, but it's less white than it was. It's more metabolically active. It's been trained as a result of this cold exposure. All of these things activate metabolic rate, right? Any of these tissues training means more metabolism can happen. There's probably more proteins that need to be maintained. Metabolic rate goes up. And we saw that in the Greenland field study. This phenomenon you can see identified here in this, this typical flow chart, where normally you've got a lot of white adipose. And that's a big problem in our modern society. It's undesirable. Uh, where it's packed in the body has different health consequences, but generally it's a... Uh, it's an undesirable trait that people are always concerned with. Not that it's good or bad, but they're concerned with it. So white adipose, in response to cold, can become brown adipose, can start to beige, as it were. And we also start to produce brand new brown or beige fat cells from these precursor cells. So we have this multiple-pronged approach where when cold is applied, we get more of this metabolically active fat tissue. And you can see UCPs, 
are implicated here, like we talked about on the last slide, more uncoupling proteins. I don't know if you've ever heard about PGC1-alpha. PGC1-alpha is a signal in the cell that is kind of a master regulator. When you exercise, this turns on and it delegates all of the changes that need to happen. So turning this on is, is really good in the context of training, of becoming more metabolically active. And the cold does all of these things. Um, yeah, I forgot why I put that arrow there, but I suppose what, what we're getting at is the idea that environmental cues, cold, exercise, all lumped in together, these are stimuli that can make this happen, that can make the transition or beijing happen. Um, both of them seem to have similar effects. All right, I'm going to call it here because the next few slides that we're getting into are examples of this. We are looking at magnitude, we're looking at changes, we're looking at where in the body it happens, and we're trying to explain the mechanisms behind this, uh, this flow chart. Here, I suppose it's best to stop and just think, okay, we have a premise in hand. Now we'll explore the mechanism when we get back to class on, uh, on no, today's Thursday, Tuesday next week. All right. We'll finish this off, we'll get some cold water immersion under our belts, and then we'll be, we'll be done the cold water section altogether. So have a wonderful weekend.